My name is Jane Smith. Um, I live in Golka um, and my experience of the pandemic has been mixed. Um, certainly in the first lockdown, it was unusual uh, because I started the Golka Mutual Aid Group of local community volunteers and I ran that for the duration of the lockdown and partly into uh, the tier three restriction as well. It was on the 16th of March that I felt along with many other people, I think, that this something big was, was coming at us and we weren't prepared. And as I said, I wanted to do something, but when I looked online to see what I could do, other than volunteering for the WVS, there was nothing to help the immediate community. Now, my parents at the time were elderly, they're 90 years old, and I'm very stubborn, very independent, and I knew that when we were then looking at a lockdown for over 70s only, from the 23rd of March. And I knew that that generation, they're stiff necked, aren't they? They don't want to ask for help. So the chances are that we were going to be dealing with a whole bunch of people that had never asked for any help in their lives, weren't quite sure how to do it, but probably within a week would might well be running out of food, running out of money, et cetera, et cetera. So it seemed very clear to me that there was a need for a group that would provide basics, the shopping, post, picking up prescriptions, that kind of thing. I started ringing around the churches and, you know, see what they were doing because I felt sure that there would be some community group that was already there and I didn't want to tread on people's toes and there wasn't. And indeed, what came home to me was that a lot a lot of the volunteers in our society are actually over 70 and, you know, I was talking to people who said our entire congregation is, is going behind, is going to live behind the shield from next Monday. And that was a real, oh my God, you know, a real, a hefty realization for me. I hadn't, I hadn't, it, it brought it home to me how much we depend on this, this silent people. So I started advertising on Facebook, on the community groups, asking for volunteers and explaining what we were doing and gathering names. I got in touch with a local printer. Um, he agreed to print leaflets, found a fabulous techie whiz who set up um, a, a, a phone line so that we had a helpline that we could advertise. And um, yeah, it was a very busy week. As a result of the mail drop, everybody in the village knew what we were doing. Um, and so they were aware of the group. I went on the local community Facebook page and I spotted a lady who had gone on there asking for fabric remnants to make a laundry bag for what she called, I think, frontline services. What it was for was for the community midwives at Calderdale and HRI hospitals. And she had some friends there and they were having to strip off their uniforms as they came through the door and throw them in the washing machine. And by that time, there was this thing circulating about laundry bags that it would make a lot easier for them if they could just stuff it in there, pull the drawstring, chuck the whole thing into the washing machine, and it just made life a lot easier for them. And if that made it easier for nurses at that time, that was a damn good thing because they were really under pressure. So she explained all this to me and um, she said, you know, do you know anyone who's got some fabric? And she was after making four or five for her friends. That she said that each nurse needed two, ideally. So I suggested to her, maybe there would be people out there that could make more bags for more people. So I did that. And yeah, <laughs> we got inundated. The whole of the Cone Valley must have been whirring to the sound of sewing machines because we had people down in Marsden. We had people in Slawick. Uh, we had people in Golka. We had people over in Coke Burton. There was a ladies' group over in Coke Burton. Um, someone in Dalton. There was a little old lady in Lindley that was determined she was going to make at least one bag. With the best one in the world, I'd expected people to just get old pillowcases and put a drawstring through. People went into their linen cabinets and were bringing out these beautiful fabrics because it had to be 100% cotton because it had to go in the boil wash. And they had these lovely, really pretty bags. That they were, it was just, it was a delight. It really was. This 
is an ear protector. And, you know, like everything, there's a story behind that. One of our volunteers suggested that we look at doing something like this um, to help the nurses who were working with um, masks that went behind, uh, they're elasticated behind their ears. And of course, that's fine wearing a mask. We all wear them now for an hour, two hours, but to wear them for 10, sometimes 12 hours, especially underneath the PPE, where they were getting all hot and sweaty and nasty, wasn't very nice. Um, this is a really simple thing where you place it behind your head and you loop the elastic onto the buttons. When we were first talking about these, there were some knitted ones and we had a, a, we had a day sort of havering about wool and knitting. And then one of our people in the village um, popped up, Tracy, Tracy Woods, and her little group of crafters had been doing these for some friends that worked over at Barnsley Hospital, I think it was. Um, and they crocheted away like bilio. And I, I don't know how many hundreds of these they made. Hundreds and hundreds of these um, have been made for, I'm sure, very grateful nurses. Like most people at the, at the start of this, I was extremely fearful. If you're frightened, you either go in, into yourself or you, you, you try and do something constructive. And, and I'm a great believer in, in, in doing things to try and control that fear. It doesn't stop it going away, but it helps you, helps you deal with it.